why would we be interested in PAHs? Um, well, PAHs, I'm sure you've, you've learned probably more about PAHs than you ever thought you wanted to know. But uh, they have some undesirable characteristics. They are toxic, they are carcinogenic, they are teratogenic, and they are mutagenic, which means they cause mutations, they cause birth defects, they cause cancer, and they kill things. So that's a reason for us to be interested in PAHs in the environment. So let's talk about PAHs for just a minute. Sorry, you're going to have to have some chemistry. You invited you a chemist to talk to you. You're going to have to get some chemistry. But we'll try and keep it straightforward. PAHs are a very large group of contaminants or of compounds. Um, but what they all have in common is the building block of a benzene ring. This is a benzene ring here. It's not a PAH, but it's what all PAHs are based on. It's a very elegant molecule. It has six carbons in a ring symmetrically, and each one has a little hydrogen sticking off the end. You can think of a benzene ring like a six-sided bathroom tile. And just like a six-sided bathroom tile, you can arrange benzene rings in different numbers and different geometric configurations, and each one of those will be a PAH. So we can go everywhere from two rings, which is naphthalene, all the way up to seven rings there, which is coronene, and you can make them even bigger than that. So all of those are PAHs, every different way you can put those tiles together, like puzzle pieces. They have different chemical uh, characteristics on the basis of their size. So the smaller ones tend to be more soluble. The larger ones tend to be more persistent, tend to stick to sediment, tend to be more carcinogenic. Now, you, there are some more slightly complicated naming conventions that go with PAHs, and one of those, which is kind of the poster child of PAHs, is called benzoapyrene. But it's not all that complicated. What it means is that we take a four-sided pyrene ring by pyrene molecule, we add a benzene ring to the A position, and that makes benzoapyrene. We're going to get back to benzoapyrene in a couple of slides and hear more about that one. So um, we started analyzing PAHs in sediment cores in the late 1990s, and we were surprised because the general wisdom at that time was that PAH concentrations were decreasing because in the 1950s and 1940s, people were burning a lot of coal and a lot of wood for home heating, and when we switched over from that to other forms of heating, more efficient forms, PAHs were declining in the, in the environment, and that was true in older lakes, except we saw in a lot of newer lakes we started to see increases in PAH concentrations in the 80s and 90s. So that kind of flew in the face of the, of the conventional wisdom, and we published our first paper on that in the year 2000. We then continued, um, this was based on 10 lakes, um, we continued to analyze more cores from more lakes to see if we could get a better handle on this, this kind of disturbing trend. And in 2005, we published um, a study where we looked at a number of different carbon-based uh, contaminants in lakes, and sure enough, this was based on 38 lakes, PAHs were increasing while a lot of other contaminants were decreasing. So each one of those symbols is a lake where we've collected a sediment core. Uh, the green arrows are downward trends since 1970. The little uh, white rectangles there mean no statistically significant trend. And the orange up arrows are upward trends. And we, we really, these upward trends in PAHs really jumped out at us. And being the scientists that we are, being the detectives that we are, we wanted to know why. And that's what led us down this path. Um, about the same time, um, some local work that we were doing with the city of Austin led them to bring us some data that they had on PAHs that really, really surprised us. Um, they had collected uh, a number of stream bed samples from little tiny tributaries, drainage ditches really, in mostly residential areas, draining housing developments, draining um, multifamily housing areas, and they had very high concentrations of PAHs, high, higher, I say surprising because they were higher dust than anything that we'd measured in any urban lake, including the Charles River in Boston. So the most contaminated sediments we'd seen were not as contaminated as these little urban drainages. And they were concerned, they saw some broken up asphalt at the top of the drainages, they thought, well, maybe it's the asphalt. Um, and to, just as a comparison for how high is that concentration of 1,500 milligrams per kilogram, which is also referred to as parts per million, so it's 1,500 parts out of a million parts, 
um, the probable effect concentration, which is the concentration at which we would expect to see adverse effects on aquatic biology, is 23 milligrams per kilogram. So that 1,500 kind of sent up some red flags. So we were scratching our heads to try and figure out what was the possible source of these high concentrations. Now, there are a lot of PAH sources in the environment, particularly in urban environments. That's because whenever we burn anything that has carbon, we create PAHs. Also, any product that involves carbon burning in the industrial process will also contain PAHs. So there's PAHs in tires. There's PAHs in auto exhaust. There's PAHs in not unused motor oil. Your motor oil is pretty low in PAHs when you buy it in the store, you pour it in your car, and then you cook it up in your car, and you create high concentrations of PAHs. However, a very astute uh, staff member with the city of Austin observed that at the top of a couple of these drainages that had the really high concentrations, there were parking lots, and on the parking lots there was black stuff. And he found out that the black stuff, the black painted surface, was seal coat, and what was in the seal coat was coal tar. So that turns out to be, we believe, a important urban source of PAHs. So let's compare the concentrations that are in some of these urban sources. Now, all of these values I have pulled from published literature studies in the scientific literature where people have gone out, measured the PAHs associated with these different urban sources. So right off the bat, you see that asphalt is very unlike to be, likely to be the source of a concentration that's 1,500 milligrams per kilogram. What I would like to remind you is that concentrations aren't additive. So you can't mix asphalt and brake lining particles and get something that's twice as high as either of them. If concentrations were additive, we could mix beer and wine and get tequila. And it doesn't work that way. In order to create something that's 1,500 milligrams per kilogram, we have to start with something that's a lot higher than that because it's going to get diluted out by other things that are lower in concentration. Coal tar-based pavement seal coat, this is the average of four products that were analyzed by the city of Austin, had a concentration of 92,000 milligrams per kilogram. So this certainly caught our attention as a potential PAH source in the urban environment. So to put this into context, Coal tar-based seal coat has about, depending on which product you analyze, between 70 and 100 times as much PAHs as used motor oil. And just think for a minute about the lengths that we go to to make sure that people dispose of that in a responsible way. 